So good afternoon again. Uh, it's just been such an exciting day um, for, for me, as I'm sure for many of you. Um, we had an incredible uh, series of speakers uh, here today. Some of the really the top thinkers, I think, from around the world could talk to us about the question of what is a poem, uh, ranging um, you know, across time and space uh, and language in um, amazing ways. So um, I want to thank in particular uh, Rowan Green, Anjali Nerlikar, Marjorie Perloff, um, and uh, Steph Burt, Nikki Skillman, and Dawn Cher, um, and also Bruce Holsinger and Elizabeth Fowler for chairing those sessions. Uh, really, we couldn't have wished for a more exciting lineup of, of speakers here in Charlottesville. Can we give them all a hand? Uh, second, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Creative Writing, and the Institute for uh, Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures, uh, who helped to make this symposium possible. I'd also like to thank the generous donors, Roger and, uh, and Robin Millay, um, also the Provost of the University, and especially the Dean of Arts and Sciences for providing the visionary support that resulted in the creation. Center for Poetry and Poetics. And third, I'd really like to thank my uh, partner in all of this, Peter Miller, uh, Center's Assistant Director, who for a year now, we've really been working on this for a year together, uh, has labored tirelessly and brilliantly uh, to help make this inaugural event. Now to the business at hand, uh, the business of the hour. Uh, when we first screamed up the symposium, uh, we couldn't imagine a more fitting conclusion to, uh, to it than to talk with someone with a special insider's knowledge uh, of the art of what makes a poem. Um, and so allow me to introduce our special guest. Um, then we'll have a little conversation about what is a poem, and finally we'll conclude with questions um, from, a few questions from the audience. It's an honor to introduce Rita Dove to you. Uh, many of you know her uh, quite well, but uh, just to uh, remind you, um, you know, as we, uh, sometimes we take our colleagues uh, and teachers for granted, but uh, what an eminent presence we have in our midst. Uh, Rita and I have taught for most of the last three decades in the English department here at UVA. And whenever I found myself with Rita, um, you know, in the parking lot or in the elevator of Ryan Hall, however mundane uh, setting, I always felt myself in the power, uh, sorry, uh, in close to the power of someone so tuned to the cadences and pitch of language, so alert to the ethical complexities and challenges of American, African American world history, so close to the sensual thrill bodily and intellectual spirit experience of the world uh, as to feel both lucky and abashed at the same time. Of course, all day we've been pondering this question of what is a poem, and um, maybe in Rita Dove's case, it, it may be in part a verbal artifact crafted to be uh, both boldly assertive, uh, yet exquisitely careful and self-effacing, splashy, yet understated, robust, yet almost cunning in its control, or in the words of one of her lyrics, romantic but requiring restraint, rise and fall, precise execution. Confounding such contraries, she shows that a poem can be as rigorously subtle and studied as a juror engraving, and at the same time as urgent and vivid, brassy and eruptive as the trumpet solo. The poem can also, she shows us, straddle an astonishing variety of cultural inheritances, white and black, high and low, fictive and historical. Whether the downheartedness of a blues croon or the high artifice of a classical sonata, the girlishness of the biblical Salome or the proud poise of Hattie McDaniel, the tumbling cadences, cadences of the vernacular or the commanding rest stop of the high literary flourish, Rita Dove claims the poet's right to make them all her own. 
Such diverse cultural resources are made to keep time together, given the sinew and heft and bone of these rhythms, new turns of phrase, startling metaphors, made to shine afresh in our mind's eye, to resonate and dwell on your inner ear. In its synthesis of cultures and styles, music and movement, hers is a portrait of grace and her pith, quiet wit and large wonder. Your brochure gives you uh, a bio, so I'll just remind you very briefly that um, since 1989, Rita Dubs taught here at the University of Virginia, where she's come as a professor of English, that in addition to her books of poetry, including her acclaimed recent collected poems, she has published short stories, a play, a novel, and an anthology that winner of the National Medal of Arts, the Pulitzer Prize, the National Humanities Medal, and many other honors. She was from 1993 to 1995 Poet Laureate of the United States. Whom better to ask, what is the poem? Could you join me in giving a hand to keep it up? So um, I thought maybe we could start off by talking about, um, you know, I'll try to ask you about what is a poem in a few different ways. Um, and, um, you know, of course, poems, one might argue, you know, sometimes quite explicitly in the artist poetic tradition that you've written in, but maybe always implicitly are themselves kind of wrestling with and answering and exploring that question. Um, and I was wondering if you wouldn't mind starting off by reading for us your early poem geometry. Um, now you might say, well, what will poem called geometry tell us about what a poem is, right? But uh, I think it's it's a poem about geometry, but um, I wonder if maybe it's uh, it also has its implicit answers to the question of what is a poem. Talk about. Um, well, first of all, I want to say I'm really, really happy to be here with Tim. Um, as well, because as, as Dom Cher was talking about uh, just a few moments ago, uh, the idea of what a poem is, is seems to be almost beside the point. And yet, this is what we're using just to be able to talk about poetry in many different ways. I resisted writing an article on it for many years of people writing them, and I was like, what? Um, then I realized I was writing them all along. And this poem is one of those. Geometry. I prove a theorem and the house expands. The windows jerk free to hover near the ceiling. The ceiling floats away with a sigh. As the walls clear themselves of everything but transparency, the scent of carnations leaves with them. I am out in the open, and above the windows have hinged into butterflies. Sunlight glinting where they intersected. They are going to some point true and unproven. I think my first of the writing use of the word epiphany occurred in math and science. And this was one of those. To me, it felt that if you, in geometry requires a Let's say trust in uncertainty and in that which is invisible. And if you can sit in a room, because when I first uh, hit geometry, I, I, I just couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do. How can I have a point with no dimension and lines that went on forever? And uh, my brother, who was two years old, was interested in computer science and said, Let's paint the wrong side. Said, just sit in this room until you figure it out. <laughs> and I sat there and I looked at what was around me, the physical room, and realized that <coughs> lines, the ones I could see, could theoretically go on forever. Once I had that leap of imagination, I realized, let me see what the difference in that. It's always based on something that 
and certain. And yet I wanted to bring that world of science, which always for uh, those of us who are in the arts and humanities sometimes seems to be very exciting. I wanted to bring it into the into the poem because I felt that that really poetry is everywhere and it's in every discipline. Well, and one of the things I just love about the poem is the way that it suggests kind of the, you know, that, that metaphor of the, the architectural space is kind of expanding and uh, kind of almost uh, you know, infinitely in some ways. And one of the things we were talking about is how the, the architecture of the poems, whether the, you know, through the metaphor of the shipping container or what, or what have you. But um, there's, a, there's a way in which you capture that kind of um, imaginative expansiveness at the same time of the, kind of, of the poetic imagination, uh, although obliquely through talking about the man. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's also that the, this idea yeah. of, of expansion, which was also bumping against right. the, the shape, yeah. the, of the poem. It's also the shape of the container. Yeah. I think any, anything that fills us with awe, we are more aware of the boundaries that it transcends and the boundaries that and close us, uh, make us happy, uh, and secure that we can step out of them. And so, anything that feels good, uh, it, it fills us with, it fills us with awe, which is great. Yeah. At the same time, we feel like stepping out of it. That's great. That's so fantastic. Well, another way um, I thought we might um, get at this question is thinking about the relationship between poems and other arts and Math, and uh, you know, um, you've written many poems that borrow from other genres, history, visual arts, music, and dance, just to name a few. And you show us time and again in your poems how um, poetry can draw on these other forms for sustenance. Can, uh, uh, but you're, I wonder if your work also might help us to see some of the ways uh, in which you know poetry has also perhaps unique capabilities as well. Um, uh, you know, commenting on the relation of poetry to history and probably sewing, music, puzzles. You once said in an in interview, poetry can contain all those things. To me, it's the noblest of the arts. So I thought maybe we could talk a little bit through a few of your poems about um, how poems are, are like and unlike works in these other forms. Um, and the first poem I, I thought of in relation to this is Augusta, the Winged Man in Russia, the Black Dove, um, which uh, is just such a, a magnificent uh, poem in response to a painting that um, apparently you saw, I think, in Germany. Um, and of course, there's this old idea of the ekphrastic poem, Victor uh, of uh, um, But one of the things I, I like to have my students explore when I, when I teach that poem uh, is the you know, and it's incredibly complex, I think, in the poem. Uh, but what it suggests about how a poem is both like and, and again, unlike a painting. Um, so I was wondering if you would mind reading the poem and we can, we can talk about it. Excuse me. Um, yes. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt, sure. but is anyone else having a difficulty hearing through these mics? Yes. They're, they're yes. Oh, we can't understand all what we're saying. I'm sorry. No, no, this I'm is sure very important. I'm this beautiful, without your mind, you'll be wonderful. Oh, I think it's, you might. keep, keep the end of the yeah, sentence yeah, yeah. is up. You yes. drop your voice at the end okay. of the sentence. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 Speak louder. adjust us in some way? Speak louder. Turn up the trouble. But I think the handheld looks even more cool. Uh, okay. Okay. This, is this is better. This is better than the hand. This is better than the hand. Yeah, we does is muddy. Oh, it sounds muddy. You think the hand is it on? Can you put the treble up? Yeah, I'll project. Yeah, just to ah. be loud. Okay. Do you want me to do that? That is muddy. That's the mic. I'll try his mic. How did you ask me? Or we can trade mics on Well, this is a, okay, can you hear me in the back? Can you, yeah. It's much better. All right, then. Oh, so we'll take, we'll take a look. Thank you for saying that. I, I couldn't hear you. 
understand if you're No, no, no. If you can't understand, what you're doing, what's the point? Just keep raising your hand in the back if you can't hear me, all right? All right. Here we go. Perfect. <laughs> all right. So. Yes. Oh, I'm so, reading a poem. Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, if you don't. No, I can read the poem. And it's true. This poem was um, sparked by a, a painting that I had seen in Berlin. The artist is a, was a, a German artist, um, Schad was his name, and uh, let me just read the poem first, then I will tell you the rest of the time. Augusta the winged man and Rasha the black dove. Schad paced the length of his studio and stopped at the wall, staring at a blank space. Behind him, the clang and hum of Hardenbergstrasse, its automobiles and organ grinders. Quarter to five. His eyes traveled to the plaster scrollwork on the ceiling. Did that hold back heaven? He could not leave his skin. Once he'd painted himself in a new one, silk green, worn like a shirt. He thought of Russia, so far from Madagascar, turning slowly in place as the boa constrictor coiled counterwise its heavy love. How the spectators gawked, exhaling beer and sour herring sighs. When the tent lights dimmed, Russia went back to her trailer and plucked a chicken for dinner. The canvas, not his eye, was merciless. He remembered Katya, the Russian aristocrat, late for every sitting, still fleeing the October Revolution, how she clutched her sides and said not one word. Whereas Augusta, the doorbell rang, was always on time, lip curled as he spoke in wonder of women trailing backstage to offer him the consummate bloom of their lust. Shad would place him on a throne, a white sheet tucked over his loins, the black suit jacket thrown off like a cloak. Augusta had told him of the medical students at the Charité, that chill arena where he perched on a cot, his torso exposed, its crests and fins a colony of birds trying to get out, and the students, lumps caught in their throats, taking notes. Ah, Rasha's foot on the stair. She moved slowly as if she carried the snake around her body always. Once she brought fresh eggs into the studio, flecked and warm as breath. Augusta in classical drapery then, and Rasha at his feet. Without passion, not the canvas, but their gaze so calm, was merciless. Now, hmm, my, I, my desire, first and foremost, was not to replicate the painting. The painting did its job already. It was a work of art. It struck you dumb. You looked at it and immediately got the images that only emerge in the poem much later. Right? You get the image of this man who is a freak of nature, put that like that, in quotations, with a deformed body and who is white and a woman who is black, but there's nothing wrong with her. She's just black in Berlin in 1929 with a boa constrictor for a little framing. <laughs> what I wanted to dig into was to explore that point of creation for any artist. I mean, that point where you decide how to place them in the, in, in the um, portrait, the double portrait, and how that, in a certain way, also replicates how you place them in the poem, right? So that was 
my initial and my primary like drive when I went to school. So, and uh, there must have been also a weird mirror effect when you see Russia in the painting, and here you are, uh, you know, th that whole dynamic on the one hand, and then then there's the mirroring that your poem does in relation to the painting, but it's, as you're suggesting, it's not really a mirroring in that, you know, you, 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 you give us a narrative, and the Painting gives us, as you say, a kind of immediacy of, you know, uh, of the images. Um, you know, the, a painting has it in some ways over a poem in, you know, that kind of simultaneity. So, so I guess I wonder, you know, uh, as we think about that as such a, a great example, um, you know, are, are there things that it suggests that a, that a poem's better at doing sometimes than a painting is, and some things that a painting might be better at than, than a poem? Well, some things that a painting certainly is better at is simultaneity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the immediacy of that, the idea that you can be uh, struck by the painting and never need words to describe that. And one of the things, I mean, the, uh, poetry is the one uh, discipline where, in a concentrated form, the tools that you are using are the tools that everybody uses in, in, in everyday discourse. So we're using language, but we're using it in such a way to um, make it strange and make it new again. Also, though, poetry and all literature and, and even music um, have the, I could guess it is the fiction of a narrative that leads to the, the lyric moment, right. uh, particularly in, in, even in the lyric, but particularly in a narrative poem. So, um, what that does, though, I mean, we can look at it as a disadvantage, you know, but I never did. Uh, I, I feel that what that does is allow you to dwell in the moment a little bit longer mm -hmm. and to be pulled into its 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 mystery yeah. uh, at, without it overwhelming you yeah, yeah. until it strikes you down, hopefully, at the end, <laughs> or where, or many places in between. Um, and as um, that wonderful Derek Walcott poem, which that, that Steph read, uh, that it, it lasts for a moment and maybe that moment is enough. You know, it's all we have and enough for that moment. So uh, it's, it's an interesting thing. I think even the pressure of time is something that perhaps a poem has over uh, the, the, the photograph. When I say the pressure of time is that, that even, I think in a lyric, yes, even in a lyric, you feel that you have stepped for a moment you're in a bubble and you're going to step out of it and go on with your life. But that time is around you, yeah. holding you there. And with a narrative poem, it's just a bigger bubble, but, <laughs> you, know, but you know, but you're in it. And that, that ephemerality, the moment that you know you're going to lose it, is what also makes it so precious. Mm -hmm. It's it's great. And uh, you know, I, I guess just one last question about that. I mean, because Again, one of the com complexities of the poem is that there are these multiple vectors of identification. In some ways, you know, we're we're made to feel that you know you or, or even we as readers have resemblances to the the painter who has this gaze mm -hmm. who looks at these sideshow performers. Mm -hmm. On on the other hand, we're we feel like we're looking out from the canvas at the you know the, the, those kind of shifts of the right. gaze. Yes. Maybe you can achieve more, perhaps in some ways, in a poem, those kind of splittings of sympathy and empathy mm -hmm. and... Uh, well, you know, the first time I saw this this double portrait, I was obviously struck. I mean, I looked at Rasha and I felt like I was looking at myself. Her hair was at the same as mine at that point. And, um, and in, on my second book, I, I managed to get that as the cover because I wanted that. It, it felt like a, a, a mirror. And uh, there was another thing, which I don't know if it pertains to what you just mm -hmm. said, but I'm going to throw it in there anyway. And that is that that um, I had always chafed under the, the impression that I had that many painters could not see mm. black people accurately. Yeah. There are so many, especially when you get into the earlier years of the centuries, there's so many depictions of 
of black uh, people who which are completely distorted as if they could not see them for the the novelty of, of their skin. And this uh, portrait was absolutely clear. He saw it. And I thought for him to see that clearly, he had to see into the way that they were looking at him mm -hmm. and saying, look at me, mm -hmm. look at me. And that's why the whole process of him, uh, his second skin, you know, mm -hmm. worn like a shirt and and the idea that I could, in the poem, which you couldn't do in the, in the painting, talk about their lives, how they approached, how they came to the studio and became themselves for a moment, even though I wasn't there at the script turn in, um, <laughs> uh, was, was also important. So, um, yeah. Well, it's great. I mean, you know, because you start us off where hearing about him and his life and what he's doing, and he arranges these figures with classical drapery and so forth. Yeah. Maybe like you, the artist, uh, you know, who's writing the poem, you're arranging these figures, composition and so forth. But by the end, we're completely looking back out at the, the artist and, you know, their gaze is merciless. And it's just, uh, you know. <laughs> 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 it's still, yeah, it's so, so, so really, really, uh, but, but, but I think, I guess that's one of the things that a poem can do is, is draw yeah. out that, uh, that complexity. Yeah, I think you can, and in this poem, what what you can't see is, is that, because um, I just read it, I tried to indicate it, that the words are sometimes deployed across the right. page. It's not a very neat circle of container, but there are moments where the words actually are, are composed across the page. In a, it's hard to talk about, I guess. I mean, I think sometimes to replicate the process of thought, sometimes to replicate so, so that our eye is trained to see instead of really listen. Um, and then there's also the element of, oh, I grew up with a whole bunch of storytellers. The shaggy dog story, the story that tells you that you, you just have to listen to all of the elements in order to understand it. It's a puzzle element. I love puzzle books too. So, but, but you know, so that idea that you have to bear in mind Hard to bear to toss it. Keep this information in your head. You know, keep this. Keep the the copy of the Russian aristocrat in your head. You know what the heck? But it gives you a sense of where, what time we're in, in order for the whole thing to come together. So it's a lot to ask as a reader, but but then you have hopefully the joy of the language itself and the cadence of the words, which will buoy you. For sure. And one of the things we can't have in a reading, which we talked a lot about this morning, is the visual form of the poem on the page. But what you do there with your um, scattering of lines and harsh enjambments is, you know, it's just, anyway, a whole other dimension. But uh, maybe I should uh, uh, turn to a, turn us to another poem in another intersection. Um, um, I think of your, your poem, Parsley, as one of the, the great contemporary poems about uh, you know, coming to grips with historical atrocity. Um, and, you know, in some ways we might think of it as a work of history, right? Uh, uh, it's anchored in a real event. And yet, you know, if, if I wonder if it, in its difference from certain kinds of history, if in, in its ways of entering and recreating history, it might, it might suggest um, something about what a poem can be especially good at as a lens through which to look at history. So um, I don't know. I know that that's a very emotionally taxing poem. Would it be too much to ask you to possibly read it? Uh, if you don't want to read it. I will it. read it. No, okay. no. Okay. I'll read it. Um, you know, it was an emotionally taxing poem uh, to write in also because I also, I just didn't want to write it. And um, it was a real event. It was already overwhelming in its I don't even know what, how to call it still. Um, basically, the real event, for those of you who may not uh, know this, is uh, in the Dominican Republic, uh, Rafael Trujillo had um, ordered uh, 20,000 Haitian blacks to be executed. At least that's how many approximately were executed. 
they worked side by side with the uh, patients in the cane fields and the only way he could distinguish the two, uh, the two different uh, uh, nationalities was to have the uh, cane workers pronounce a word that had an R in it because the, the Haitians uh, spoke with a more French-based Creole so it, it, they didn't have the, the rolled R of the Spanish. And so the word he chose was perejil, means parsley. It, and so, um, anyway, I had come across this and did not want to write because I thought this, it was too big, it was too, I don't know what, and, and I couldn't let it go. So here is the performance in two parts, uh, each has a title. Parsley, the cane fields. There is a parrot imitating spring in the palace its feathers parsley green. Out of the swamp, the cane appears to haunt us, and we cut it down. El General searches for a word. He is all the world there is. Like a parrot imitating spring, we lie down screaming as rain punches through, and we come up green. We cannot speak an R. Out of the swamp, the cane appears, and then the mountain we call in whispers, Catalina. The children gnaw their teeth to arrowheads. There is a parrot imitating spring. El General has found his word, Perejil, who says it lives. He laughs, teeth shining out of the swamp. The cane appears in our dreams, lashed by wind and streaming, and we lie down. For every drop of blood, there is a parrot imitating spring out of the swamp. The cane appears. The palace. The word the general has chosen is parsley. It is fall when thoughts turn to love and death. The general thinks of his mother, how she died in the fall, and he planted her walking cane at the grave, and it flowered, each spring stolidly forming four star blossoms. The general pulls on his boots. He stomps to her room in the palace, the one without curtains, the one with a parrot and a brass ring. As he paces, he wonders, who can I kill today? And for a moment, the little knot of screams is still. The parrot, who has traveled all the way from Australia in an ivory cage, is coy as a widow, practicing spring. Ever since the morning, his mother collapsed in the kitchen while baking skull-shaped candies for the Day of the Dead, the general has hated sweets. He orders pastries brought up for the bird. They arrive dusted with sugar on a bed of lace. The knot in his throat starts to twitch. He sees his boots the first day in battle, splashed with mud and urine as a soldier falls at his feet, amazed. How stupid he at the sound of artillery. I never thought it would sing, the soldier said and died. Now the general sees the fields of sugarcane lashed by rain and streaming. He sees his mother smile, the teeth gnaw to her arrowheads. He hears the Haitians sing without R's as they swing the great machetes. Catalina, they sing, Catalina. Mi madre, mi amor le muerte. God knows his mother was no stupid woman. She could roll an R like a queen. Even a parrot can roll an R. In the bare rooms, the bright feathers arch in a parody of greenery as the last pale crumbs disappear under the blackened Someone calls out his name in a voice so like his mother's. A startled tear splashes the tip of his right boot. My mother, my love in death. The general remembers the tiny green sprigs men of his village wore in their capes to honor the birth of a son. He will order many this time to be killed for a single beautiful word.
So, um, this started out as, as then as music because I had to imagine the repetition of that word. You had to do it over and over and over again. And in this case, I had all of this material and I didn't know what container to put it in. And um, what I did with this poem was actually very, very um, cold-bloodedly, I hate to use that, but I will, decided to try certain forms. And so I decided that I'm going to make a bell now in the first part. What better form for this repetition? And when I say that I did that in a very, uh, I just decided to do it, it's because I had facts. I had facts, all sorts of facts. What I needed to do was to find the way to make those facts new, to bring us back into that moment. And, and then I thought, OK, I go, if I write this bill now, I will discover something about this moment, how we can repeat for. And so that's why I did it. And there were certain things that, that came up, like um, that, that, that vexome parrot, who just also is something that repeats and repeats and repeats things. Um, what can poetry do uh, besides history? Uh, well, obviously, I, cannot, I could not have gotten into the brain or to the thoughts of Kabir. Um, I wanted to explore why. Why? How could someone arrive at such a creative method of inflicting um, death? And that meant creating a fiction, but creating it in such a way that would convince us not on a rational level, but uh, in a way that made us breathe it. Hence, poetry. Hence, music. The second part is a failed sestina. <laughs> <laughs> But the words are still there, and they just keep popping up in irregular moments. But uh, Sestina was too weak, it was too pretty for the second part. Uh, they always have these repeated words, but the fact that they pop up all the time, Australia or Green or, um, you know, the, that parrot, um, that it, it uh, hopefully it shocks us, it makes it, puts us not at ease, not well, that's one of the things, I guess, that it does that might be different from a, a, a dry kind of historical recounting of it, that it does implicate us, uh, and you, in a way, are willing to implicate yourself in some ways in this kind of repetitive, obsessive, uh, compulsive kind of thinking mm -hmm. that then Trujillo, you know, obviously exhibits in such a macabre, grotesque, horror, monstrous way, but somehow we all are made to feel like we're, by reading by the end, the, reading the poem, capable of being monsters as well. Yes, that was what the thing that I realized, the resistance that I had to this work, was that I wanted to make him completely other. He was a monster. I didn't want to deal with this. But then I thought there is an implication in this. We cannot dismiss injustice. We cannot dismiss monsters. They are human and they are part of us. So how to do that? Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to make the poem beautiful. I wanted to make it sing. Because if we can, and, and music is one of the things that, uh, one of the art, I, I think John mentioned it really, mm -hmm. it's under us and in us in a, a, a way that um, doesn't need convincing in any other way. So, so I thought if I can get this poem to sing so that we're all, breathing it together, then we're all implicated. Tough, tough, yeah, yeah um, but, but it is, it's dis distinctive. Maybe I should skip to, to this question of music, um, uh, just because I, I see time is racing. I, I had, uh, we could come back if there were sure. time, but uh, since you're bringing up the question of music, um, you know, Sonata Melodica is, um, and in many of your other volumes, poetry, a poem considers itself in, in its resemblance to and difference, maybe also difference from the musical arts. And, and as you say, you know, we often 
think about poems as being uh, involved in a kind of use of language that's particularly song-like or, or musical, um, uh, or has a musical intensity, you know, all that chiming and rhyming and, and repetition, recursiveness, and so forth. Um, but again, I don't think we would ever confuse a poem with, I don't know, a cello, if I dare use an exa take an example that's very familiar to cello, cello concerto or, or a blues. So, um, and, and you, of course, are, are quite an accomplished uh, uh, performer uh, and, and also operatic singer. So, um, I don't know, uh, uh, to take it just a small, maybe this will be a small light poem we could look at after the, the extremely heavy, extreme heaviness of parsley. But um, would you mind maybe reading instrumental from Sonata and Magnifica? Would that be okay? Yes. Um, uh, and, and maybe that might help us think about this music and poetry um, comparison. I was surprised you chose this John gave me a list of poems that he'd like me possibly to read, which I welcomed, actually. I wanted to see what he came up with. Instrumental. A stick, a string, a bow. The twang as the arrow leaves it. The twang praising the imprint it makes on the air caressing the breach no one sees, shivering, struck. <laughs> so is that a description of music or is it a description of a poem or is it both? <laughs> it's both. It's, both. it's also okay. a description of an instrument. It's also a description of an arrow and a bow. <laughs> yeah. It's a very long and narrow poem. Um, and uh, it comes at the end of a, of a whole story about a violinist and, and, and uh, you know, all of that stuff, but it's also about a life. Right. So in the context of the book, it's also that. Yeah, so yeah. it's probably all of it. It's yeah. a very strange poem because there's no punctuation. For me, that's odd. I love comma and <laughs> semicolon. Um, but um, because I think these are also part, these are our little brads and nails that we use to our, our tables. Um, yeah. So, so, but, 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 what about the? You, you must have, as a, you know, a performer in both in, in these multiple oh. art forms. You know, how do you do you experience them differently? Mu music and, and poetry. Do they converge completely? Do, you know, what, what, what are? Yeah. They? Yes, I, I, I would have been a musician in an alternate reality, mm -hmm. and um, I still keep up music. Actually, they kind of talk to each other, music and poetry, and I've learned things from the performance of music that uh, apply to poetry, and there are things in poetry that I can apply to music, so and they I are love, not the same. I'd love to hear They're that. not the same. Um, well, the very fact that when you read music, and, okay, let me, okay, it's hard. It's hard. When you read music and you have a phrase that goes across the bar measure, yeah. uh, and how you, how you meet that hurdle it depends on uh, when you're producing it as a song, yeah. then, you know, crescendo or decrescendo, or how, how easy you make that curve is part of the way in which a melody can change. Sure. And I'm thinking of someone like New Simone who can right. take a, a song and, and change it in, in incredible ways by the way she decides to push, this gets back to containers, but you know, pushes that, that, that bar measure. And I learned that through singing and not and, and through playing the cello. Yeah. And uh, more, more, I think, deeply yeah. than talking about uh, in jamming at the end of the line. In jamming at the end of the line is, is sort of like that, but also different, yeah. because then you turn back. Okay. It's hard. It's, it's hard. hard. It's hard. I need to talk and it still won't work. Um, but what I'm saying is that, that, that um, there are, uh, 
is that poets can learn so much from another right. discipline and right. vice versa, right. and that they are not mutually exclusive. They're not mutually exclusive, but right. they're not the same. Either. They're not the same, right. but why not? This is all what life is. I right. think it's so incredible. A chemist, I mean, gosh. Yeah. We learn things from yeah, them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, but we see this all the time when people try to say, well, you know, songs are just, are, are poems. And, and of no, course, they, there's this deep, long tradition in which they're twinned and they come together sometimes and they are become the same thing, but then they part ways and they come back together and so forth. We see this in various ways. But over and over again, people try to reproduce songs on the page and say, this is a poem. And you think, does that work? No. No, no usually, I mean, no. It's yeah. because, well, no, I, I, I'd love to hear it. I mean, well, it, it often doesn't work because there is a there is such a uh, the, the 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 union. Not it's not a union. It's if I use chemistry, let's say the yeah. the uh, the way those two aggregate, you know, in yeah. together in a song is radically different than the way in which they do it in poetry. Right. And and in poetry, the words are to create create the music in the sense of the space in which the time in which it takes to say it. And in a, in a song, often it is the, the, the production of the sound, Absolutely. the music, that then lets the words float or go through it. That's a different way of approaching. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So I agree. Which it's doesn't different. mean that either of them is less. No. It's just no. different. It's different. It's different. And so that's why, you know, you're reading a poem, you can read it backwards and forwards and up and down, whatever. But in a song, you know, it's controlled by the performance, the time it's controlled, controlled by, by the performance, performance. exactly. Right. And this so one, you could actually read it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. yeah, it's great. So um, I realize uh, I asked you too many questions about uh, those, 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 those poems. So, um, uh, but uh, I don't know um, if, if you know, I, I skipped over your Pulitzer Prize winning Thomas and Beulah um, and, and also uh, American Smooth. I, I wanted, which I had questions I wanted to ask yeah. you about, but, I, but um, I also wanted to be respectful of the audience and allow them uh, uh, time as well. I don't know if you, if you wanted to, um, uh, you know, may, maybe we can, uh, you know, one of the things that's so wonderful about American Smooth is that it, uh, helps us, you do so many dance-like things in that volume, and again, that can help us think about uh, what, what a poem is uh, and its resemblances and differences. And, and of course, Thomas and Beulah, you enter your own kind of grandparents, uh, you know, the, the sort of ancestral history in this kind of recovery, fantastic recovery project, but it's also intensely poetic. But um, I, you know, may, maybe so that we can have a couple of questions from the audience, um, and if you want to address any of those things, uh, uh, please please do. But I but I, um, I I wanted to be sure to ask you about poetry and its relation to prose, which has come up a couple of times in our symposium. Um, when when I was in high school, um, I, I uh, had a, a very brief uh, life as a theatrical performer, playing the role in French of uh, uh, of this foolish character, Monsieur Jourdain, in uh, um, Molière's Bouge um, Gentilhomme. I think I was typecast because he was kind of a moronic <laughs> character. But you remember that uh, he's he's really astonished to learn that all his life he's been speaking prose. Number one, wow, I had no idea, and that there's nothing but prose and and verse. So um, you know, this is a question I've, I've uh, thought of, about a lot. But you write prose, you write poetry. How do you think about their different? If if overlapping capabilities or powers, and I wonder if you might be willing to read prose in a small place, which is a prose poem of yours that kind of wittily, wickedly, wryly meditates on this question. Well, yes, I'll be happy to read that. I, um, yes, I write prose, and I've written, you know, uh, uh, plays, which to me are a different way of dancing with words. Um, and I, first of all, I find the, the, the boundaries are fluid, yeah. and I relish the fact that these boundaries are fluid. And if I were to speak like a musician, I'd say the tempo, the tempo is different. Yeah. The tempo is different. So let me, let me read the poem, sure, because sure. I think it kind of addresses everything. Uh, and uh, it, it's a prose poem, as I said. I was asked to 
uh, uh, submit a poems poem to a magazine that a former student of mine had done. And uh, I told him, well, I don't know if I believe in the prose poem, but uh, I'll give it a, um, and that's, this is written in that spirit. Prose in a small space. It's supposed to be prose if it runs on and on, isn't it? All those words, too many to fall into rank and file, stumbling bare-ass drunk onto the field, reporting for duty, yes sir, spilling out as shamelessly as the glut from a mega billion dollar chemical facility, just the amount of glittering effluvium it takes to transport a little girl across a room, beige carpet thick under her Oxfords, curtains blousy with spring. Is that the scent of daffodils drifting in? Daffodils don't smell, but prose doesn't care. <laughs> prose likes to hear itself talk. Prose is development and denouement, anticipation hovering near the canopies, lust rampant in the antipasta. For example, a silver fork fingered sadly as the heroine crumples a linen napkin in her lap to keep from crying out at the sight of Lord Campion's regal brow inclined tenderly toward the wealthy young widow. Prose applauds such syntactical dalliances. Then is it poetry if it's confined? Trembling along its axis, a flagpole come alive in high wind, flapping its radiant sleeve for attention. Over here, it's me, while the white spaces, air, field, early morning silence before the school bell, shape themselves around that one bright seizure. And if that's so, what do we have here? A dream or three paragraphs? <laughs> we have white space, too. Is this music? As for all the words left out, banging at the gates. We could let them in, but where would we go with our orders, our stuttering pride? started a, 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 about 10 minutes late. Uh, if you have to leave now, because we hear the bells ringing, please, you're welcome to. But uh, why don't, if, if you're able to stay, why don't we just take a couple of questions? Always that. Yeah, always that. That one silence. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the issue of uh, uh, the relationship between song I'm thinking of any of the pieces in which you are very, very different. Even the ices, one doesn't really think of the use of enjambi in the song. Right. And one of the yes. things. Uh, but for example, have you ever sung uh, a poem of yours? <laughs> have I ever sung a poem of mine? I have in my living room sung a poem of mine that someone else had put, put music to, not me. Um, and of course, when I talk about the, the separation of, of poetry and music, I'm, I'm really talking much more about modern and contemporary poetry, a poetry since probably the advent of the printing press, so that we could pull it along because, you know, clearly poetry started out with a liar, you know, in the lyric. But um, I've done it, I, I, I don't like it. <laughs> May, may I sure. what, what don't you like? Yes. Well, the, the composer composed it for the voice to float on the air, and accompanied by the other sounds. And I had composed it to be its own sound. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, the poem has its own internal music mm -hmm. yeah. and in a way that external music kind of interferes sometimes. It interferes that way, and, and every time someone has asked, I've had uh, many, uh, I've had people compose things to mm -hmm. my poems. I, I just give up the poem. I don't, <laughs> I don't get upset, you know, at anything that I hear. Sometimes I like, you know, certain moments, but yeah. never the whole thing. I have done the only time I've ever done something with a composer that we started out with nothing was a song cycle with John Williams, 
And that was truly revelatory mm. because we both started out with nothing. And basically we're trying to figure out, I think, what each one's genre could give to each other. And there was this pivotal moment, I remember when I had the poem, finally after he hummed a few lines and he went back and forth and back and forth, he would give a little music, I would give him a little poem. I had, I thought, the perfect ending, and he said, this word doesn't sing. And he was right. If I hadn't been a singer myself, I would have gotten really upset and stomped off. He said, it doesn't give us any closure because we can't pronounce, we can't sing it. You can pronounce it, but you can't sing it. So I had to go back to that. But I learned something. Yeah. Fantastic. Can we take, can we take one more question? The question is the, the process by which my poetry comes to me. Do I think it first in prose? And I don't. I, um, and it's still mysterious to me exactly how it comes to me, but I can tell you that I can, that very often I have a sense of how large the poem is going to be, how long it's going to be. I, I, and I don't start at the beginning. I usually, sometimes a line will be in the middle, and I know it's going to be in the middle. Figure, but and then and then I work from that that point. It's hmm. sometimes it can start, you know, it can start with a with a observation because I do keep a notebook and all that, and it can start with an overheard bit of conversation. It can start with an image or something that I've seen, or but I don't think it through in prose. It would. If I think it through in prose, it's going to be prose. You know, that I, I'll, I think in the genre that I write in. And I, I, I don't think I've ever started in one genre and ended in another. I saw, I saw one hand wave, we squeeze in one last one. Is there another hand? Yes. So, so, Rita, do you want to rephrase? Do you want me to rephrase? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so that uh, uh, to to be brief, not to be uh, forgive me, I won't be true to all the subtleties of that comment. But basically, that um, we've been focusing on poetry and its relation to painting, and poetry and its relation to music, and it's not accidental because there are various convergences, uh, convergences as well as differences among these modes. Uh, um, the image, uh, the musical qualities, um, and yet we've been focusing on some of the differences, but it, aren't there similarities? Of course, yeah, there are similarities. And um, I, uh, I, as I said earlier, I, I think that the whole, the boundaries between them are more fluid than Absolutely. we allow. Uh, I think that, that uh, one of the reasons why those boundaries have become solidified is because it's easier to teach, yeah. frankly. Uh, and but there's no reason, and I think that something like Claudia Rankine's King's book, right. or if I look at a, a more a recent poetry book, Tahim Bajess's Olio, mm -hmm. uh, that there is, you see those boundaries dissolving, right. and it's just 
you, you wonder why would they ever go there. And, and one of the things poetry is constantly doing is enlarging uh, itself by, yes. by transgressing those boundaries and taking in new uh, modes and forms. No, absolutely. And I think the way that your poetry has done that with history and dance and music and uh, the visual arts and, and all these, you know, it's just been a magnificent example for all of us. Uh, Rita, you're a treasure. Uh, you're also one of the best teachers. I know this having read your evaluations when I was chair. <laughs> I hope I'm not giving away a secret here that uh, this person is an incredible hard worker, also as a colleague and as a, uh, as a teacher, as well as being a magnificent poet. And for all these things, we're most grateful. But thank you so much, Rita. Thank you.